In this one, I was like, surrender Dorothy. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep on, keep on trucking. Like dog, there we go again. A little bit of Austin, a little bit of New York. I'm nothing if not ill-prepared. The horror movie is based on a book and in the book, things are happening in real life and man, this book was messed up. And it's the Red House Merc, nope. Hi everybody, it's Audrey and welcome back to Chapter and Converse and welcome to part one of what I read in August. So technically it's not even the end of August yet, it's the 28th and I've read 11 books and I have two other ones in process. So I don't know if I'm gonna finish any more but for the sake of timing and because I talk a lot as you guys know, I figured I would break it up into two parts. But overall, I've had a really, really good reading month and I have read classics i read an older book <laughs> i don't know if it's necessarily a classic thrillers romance i have read some books that i've talked about for ages i've read some new releases so it's been like a really good month and i feel like i've had a really good mix of things i've also focused heavily on completing my book list bingo board for the summer so i posted a video a little while ago about some books i was maybe going to read for that and i actually i have to think about it for half a minute i think i stuck to books only that I talked about in that video in order to satisfy the full bingo board, which I finished today, so feeling good about myself. But without any further ado, let's talk about the first part of what I read in August. So I'm not necessarily going to talk about the books I read in the order that I read them. I'm just going to kind of mix it up a bit. But this is actually the first book I finished. And when I went back to look, Boyfriend Material by Alexis Hall. I was like, didn't I read this in July? <laughs> I feel like this has been a really long month. I just dropped my paper. So I finished this on August 1st. So technically it's August, but I loved this. And I've mentioned this book several times already in other videos because I was either in the middle of reading it and then I hauled it. And then I think I talked about Husband Material. So this is fake dating, dare I say, at its finest. And I adored this book. So this is one of those books that I had heard people talk about and it was like, I'll read it, I'll read it, I'll read it. And finally, I just was like in the mode. So I wound up getting the audiobook from my library. And this was the same case as Fool Me Once by Ashley Winstead, where I got the audiobook from my library. In this case, it was the first paragraph. Fool Me Once was the first page of the book. And I instantly was like, I'm obsessed, I must have it. So the night I started reading this, I actually went out to the bookstore and bought it and have never looked back. So this is following Luke and Oliver and Luke is kind of reluctantly famous. He is the son of two rock stars and he's kind of gotten himself into a little bit of trouble. His reputation is not quite the best and there maybe was a compromising photo of him out in the press that is not quite the best and he is in desperate need of kind of cleaning up his reputation. So his friend Bridget has a mutual friend or has a friend named Oliver, Bridget's the mutual friend. And she's like, I know this guy, you've met him before. He's a barrister, he's super great. You guys should like meet up. And Oliver is kind of also in need of a boyfriend for a specific event he has. So Oliver and Luke decide to publicly fake date to get them through this little patch they have. So Luke needs to fix his reputation, Oliver needs a date for an event, and they embark on this. But other than the fact that they're both looking for someone to date, they have nothing in common. They have a little bit of a rub in the past where they haven't quite gotten along. So this becomes obviously the case of, you know, does fake dating lead to real dating? And there's a sequel, Husband Material, which came out in August, which I purchased, so you can, decide for yourself how you think this one ends. But what I really loved about this book is not just the complete humor, which is at times inappropriate, which is at times laugh out loud funny. I listened to the audiobook of this, and this is the point in the video where I'm gonna have to bend over and pick up the piece of paper that I dropped so I can tell you who read the audiobook. I'm nothing if not ill-prepared. So this was read by Joe Jameson, who also reads Husband Material, which I'm very excited about. And I feel like just like the literal voice, the inflection, the way he conveys the humor was so spot on and perfect. I was legit, like not even like when you're like, oh, I laughed out loud. Like I was actually laughing out loud listening to this book. And I did a bit of a combo of reading and listening, which has been a big theme of mine lately. 
and I dog, like dog, there we go again, a little bit of Boston, a little bit of New York, dog-eared it big time and absolutely loved it. So part of what I loved about it was the humor of it. Part of what I loved about it is the dynamic just in and of itself between Oliver and Luke, which I thought was great. The complicated relationships that they have with their families in completely different ways. And then much like I feel an Emily Henry book, there's much more to this than just straight up romance. So I've been using the word weighty a lot to describe books that aren't just complete fluff, but it's not dark, but there is some heaviness to it in some of the topics that they talk about and some of the emotions that they talk about. And Luke has been estranged from his father for a really long time. Oliver has a complicated relationship with his parents, but I will say Luke's mom is probably one of my favorite characters ever. His best friend Bridget is also amazing. Like the friend group in this is so great. And I just like, it's one of these books where I'm like, can I come to the party? Like, can I come hang out with you guys? I wanna be friends with you guys too. But I totally loved it and it's just, such a like enjoyable book and it was escapism but it was also like i say a little bit of weightiness to it and it was like just what i needed it's like you know when you read a book and like you don't know that's just what you needed and then you're reading it and you're like this is exactly what i needed that was boyfriend material so i have intentionally saved husband material for series september i plan to read it in september so I'll let you guys know what I think, but based on how great this was, my hopes and expectations are super, super high. So highly recommend if you're looking for a bit of romance with a little bit more substance to it. And again, it's, it's funny, it's at times inappropriate, but like in all the best ways, and I adored this book. The next book I have is one of my most anticipated books of the year, and it's Runtime by Katherine Ryan Howard. I loved this one too. So this is one of those books, I pre-ordered it, it showed up, and I was just like, must read now. I could not wait to dive into this book. And I compulsively read this book over the course of like two and a half days, like just giant chunks of time, completely blew off the rest of my life <laughs> so I could read this book and I wasn't mad about it. So this takes place on the set of a horror movie and it becomes a case of real life starting to imitate things that are happening in the movie. And if you're a slasher film fan, if you're a movie fan, if you're just a fan of isolation in the woods, somewhat inexplainable, really creepy things happening, this is definitely for you. So this is my third Katherine Ryan Howard book. So I read The Nothing Man, which was amazing. I read 56 Days, which I loved, and then here we are. And I thought this was so well done. I was totally invested, I needed to know. And I used to talk about, and I mean, I don't know if I probably still talk about, one of my favorite things with the Riley Sager movie is just movie. That's me hoping that his books get made into a movie. One of my favorite things about a Riley Sager book is that I really feel like it dances the line between thriller and horror. And with this being a thriller book on the set of a horror movie, I felt like I was getting those same vibes from it. So in this one, we are following along with Adele and she's a former soap star from Ireland. Some stuff happened in her past that we're not quite sure about. When the book opens, she is out in California and she winds up getting a call about this a little bit independent movie that's getting made in Ireland. And the lead star of the movie has had to drop out, so they've called Adele and asked her if she will be the star of it. And to her, this is like her chance at redemption, her chance to come back. She is kind of on the skids with a lot of people in Ireland from her past. So she basically doesn't tell anyone that she's coming back except for her best friend. And she winds up going on this movie set in this completely isolated area and things get weird pretty quickly. And I was totally in, I was totally in because it was one of these books where I just didn't know what was happening and I wasn't sure what to believe and I wasn't sure what to think. And I had a couple theories about things and some stuff was not right at all. <laughs> some stuff, I feel like it was one of these books where if you read enough thrillers and there's things in the book where you're like, oh, that's a red herring, that doesn't mean anything, or ooh, this is definitely a clue, but then it winds up being nothing, there were breadcrumbs dropped along the way, but it was so hard to decipher 
between what maybe was a clue, what was a red herring, what was happening in the horror movie itself, what's happening in real life. Like I just felt so turned around and twisted with this book and I just loved it. I absolutely loved it. So such a fan, just such an absolute fan. And it was just so great. It was just so, so great. So the horror movie is just kind of coming to life maybe. And one of my favorite things about this book also is from a style standpoint, there's also like script pages interwoven with the narrative as part of a storytelling device, which I thought was really interesting as well. And I really liked the physical style of the storytelling, but I had such great fun with it. So like you're reading the script of the movie, but you're also reading Adele's experience living the real life version of the movie. It's like so meta and again, so head twisty. So I've said it before and I'm actually going to do it. <laughs> I just need to keep reading Katherine Ryan Howard. So I have three other books of hers that I need to read from her backlist backlist. And I'm just super excited, but I'm just happy to be in a mode also where like anticipating new releases, pre-ordering them, show up, reading them immediately and falling in love. Just all the, all, like all the warm and fuzzies, but also being freaked out at the same time. The next book I have is Killing Kate by Alex Lake. So I have had this book forever. This is one of the books I talked about in my, I think, book list bingo board. I don't even know what this fit though. Jeez, I don't even know. But this has been on my bookshelf forever and I love the premise of this book. I wound up doing a mix of reading it and doing the audiobook of it. So the audiobook was read by Geneva Swallow and this one is a serial killer is stalking your hometown and he has a type. All his victims look the same and they all look like you. So imagine a serial killer in your town and all of his victims resemble you. <laughs> How creepy. So like when the first girl dies, which has happened when the book opened, our main character Kate talks about how her friends were like, dang, she kind of looked like you. And then it happens again and she kind of looks like Kate. And you really start to wonder what's going on. So I really, like I say, loved the premise of this book. I did have a little bit of a struggle staying in it. Like I feel like I got into it, but I had a hard time staying in it. Like it wasn't always holding my attention, which is part of the reason why I flipped to the audiobook, which I definitely think helped get me like back in the story and keep me in the story but it didn't totally execute as well as I wished it could, which I feel like is always a tricky review to give to a book. So the book itself isn't bad, but I didn't wholly connect with the book. And this was also definitely a book where I could foresee some of what was going to happen, but not how it happened, if that makes sense. Like I was like, oh, I think this, is going to be part of the resolution and it was but not in the way that I envisioned it was going to be part of the resolution which also probably isn't totally helpful but it was definitely spooky and creepy and as more women are getting murdered who look like Kate her paranoia starts to increase she really starts to you know be nervous about everything around her she starts to be very spooked by things and it really starts to mess with her brain as you can imagine and then we also get hints of a mystery in the past and then we sort of flash back into time to sort of put those pieces together again as well i do think there were a lot of characters in this book that were suspects and in some ways it was like very heavy-handed so to me, it was just sort of like, there's no way this is the person because it's so obvious it's this person. But if it's so obvious it's this person, maybe it's this person. So it definitely played with my mind in a lot of ways. So it was enjoyable, but I feel like it's one of those things where like, again, at the risk of like cliching a review, like I've read better, but it was still fun. So good, but not great. There's better serial killer books out there, but the premise of this I feel like is super strong. Alex Lake has also written a bunch of books, so not writing her off in any way. I do love the physical book itself. <laughs> Just not a reason to keep it. But I'm glad I read it. Like I said, this has been on my, on my shelves for ages. So I would be curious if anyone else has read this book or read anything else by Alex Lake, because again, I'm not writing her off as an author at all. I thought it was enjoyable, just not completely 
compelling. Like runtime, I didn't want to put it down slash couldn't wait to get back to it. This is one of those books where I didn't have a hard time putting it down for the day. And to me, that just says something about my experience with the book. Next up is a reread for me, and it's Jar of Hearts by Jennifer Hillier. So I have filmed my Jennifer Hillier Spotlight video. If I was a better booktuber, I could tell you the order my books videos videos for coming out. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep on keep on trucking. And I love this book. So this time around, I did the audiobook of it, and this was read by January Lavoie. And I had such a great time with this book. So I obviously totally remember the core story of it. I've talked about this book ad nauseum and I had such an enjoyable time listening to it this time around and there are parts of this book. So let me tell you what it's about first. This is about three friends in when they were in high school, one of them went missing and then in present day, one of them goes to jail and then one of them is investigating the truth behind what really happened. And this is just so dark and messed up, so many uncomfortable scenes in this, so many shocking moments the first time I read this book. Like I was very much like, wow. Like the places that she's going in this book, my first Jennifer Hillier, I was blown away by it. And in the second reading and the listen, I specifically remembered the scenes that made me specifically uncomfortable. And I felt a little less uncomfortable the second time around. And I don't know if that's because I knew they were coming and I knew what they were all about, or if it was the audio versus reading. I feel like sometimes the audio can make a difficult scene worse. And I feel like sometimes the audio can make a difficult scene better. And I don't mean that necessarily in like, it's a bad scene, but it can heighten it in a way the audio can sometimes heighten a scene that when reading it, might not be so bad and sometimes it's vice versa. I feel like I'm talking in circles, but it felt a little less shocking to me the second time around, but I think it's because it was the second time around and it did not in any way diminish my experience of the book and it did not change my opinion about the book being just the best book she's written. So we get very complicated relationships between these three friends. So it's Angela, Gio and Kaiser and when they were juniors in high school, Angela goes missing. This is page one, this is not spoilers. And we fast forward 14 years when the book opens and her body has been found in the woods behind Gio's house and have been tied to a serial killer named Calvin James who has been arrested and who, PS, was Gio's boyfriend in high school. So we wind up seeing the fallout in the present day. We also get scenes in the past leading up to what happened to Angela. So we get the full story there. And it is, it is messy relationships. It is complicated relationships. It's secrets, it's lies, it's grief, it's pain, it's rage. Like there's so many things going on in this book. And I loved it so much, so, so much. So I've said it before and I will say it again. This is hands down, I think her darkest book that she has written. So if you haven't read any Jennifer Hillier yet and you're maybe more squeamy on squeamish on the darker stuff, might not be the best place for you guys to start. Little Secrets I feel like is a good way in. But if you have read some of her books and are looking for what to pick up next and you are a fan of the dark and messed up people doing dark and messed up things, I always will scream about this book. Brilliant, brilliant. The next book I did on audiobook and it's The Red House Mystery by A.A. A. Milne. So I talked about this in my library book haul video that I did and this is one of the many books that gets spoiled in Eight Perfect Murders by Peter Swanson. So I have a short list of books that I wanna read before reading Eight Perfect Murders and this was one of them. So A.A. A. Milne is the person who wrote the Winnie the Pooh series, the Christopher Robin series. This is his one and only mystery book that he wrote and it's very, Agatha Christie, Sherlock Holmes-ish in all the ways. And this was another book where I just did not try and solve it, was just here for the enjoyment factor of it. And it just reminded me of those kind of mystery detective series. And I really enjoyed this book. So in this one, we are at this estate, the Red House, and our main character is Mark Ablett. And his brother is coming to town from Australia, he hasn't seen him in a really long time. He is kind of a mess, his brother. And when the book opens, his brother is found murdered 
in his study with a bullet between the eyes. The door is locked from the inside and Mark is nowhere to be found. So how did this person get murdered in the house? So we are following along with Anthony Gillingham, who is friends with people at the Red House. He is showing up for a visit and happens to show up on the day when the murder happens. And along with his friend Bill, they start to investigate. And it's one of these things where I feel like, I've talked about this before, like I'm never smart enough to figure out an Agatha Christie book and I kind of don't even bother trying. And this was the same experience. So he's supposed to like rival Sherlock Holmes with his power of observation and it's very, not even like wink, wink, nod, nod. Like he refers to himself as Sherlock. He refers to his friend Bill as his Watson and together, you know, they figure out the crime. So this was just great fun, classic mystery. This is the book where I'm like, it's a classic, but like, is it a classic in the sense? I, I'm just gonna pretend it's a classic and I really enjoyed it. So I had somebody ask me, I read, listen to the version narrated by William Sutherland and I really thought it was well done. So I had a fun time with it. This was just a book that was on my list, a nice palate cleanser after reading some very dark murdery books, and I'm glad I finally read it. Next up, I have Book Lovers by Emily Henry, and you guys, she's amazing. I loved this book, absolutely love this book, totally obsessed. She is genius, genius, genius. So I did a combination not to repeat myself, but I feel like we're deja vuing here, of listening to the audiobook read by the always brilliant Julia Whalen and then reading the book because I did not, not want to be in this book at all times. It was like that kind of a book. And I just loved it. I absolutely loved it. And I've seen some people's reviews where they were, I don't know if like complaining is the right word, but saying that it's not really a romance. So I'm not really a romance reader. So, I mean, like, what makes a romance in a book? There's totally romance in this book. I don't understand why it's not. There's also, I feel like this is kind of like an in five years situation also in some ways where you think you're getting one story but you're getting something else but you're also getting something else. Let's be vague here. But also a core of this, which is not a spoiler in any way, is the sister relationship in this book. So in this book, we are following Nora Stevens and she is a book agent in New York City. And she winds up going on like a one month vacation with her little sister, Libby. So Libby is pregnant with her third child. She is begging Nora to just sort of have like this one last hurrah together. And Libby wants to go to this town called Sunshine Falls, which is in North Carolina, which is also the town in Libby's favorite book, which Nora has published. So she was the agent for the author um, for this book being published. So this is where they wind up going. And this is like that cliche town in a Hallmark movie where everything is perfect and Libby just wants to like live out the dream and be in this town. So I was listening to a podcast with Emily Henry and I owe an answer on what that podcast was because I listened to so many and I don't know off the top of my head, but I will go back and figure it out where she was talking about all those Hallmark movies, which are like basically comfort food. And you always have that big city guy or gal who winds up being sent to, drawn to some small town to like take over the store or like, raise all the houses so they can like build a development, but they wind up falling in love with the small town and they wind up like ditching their significant other back in the city who's like all intense and high strong and city-ish. So this book plays on all of those tropes like in the best way because it's totally playing into them, but it's also making like little twists on them. And I just absolutely loved it. So Nora has a foil in the city, of course, and it's this guy called Charlie Lastra. And he is a book editor. She tried to pitch the Sunshine Falls book to him years ago, and he basically turned his nose up at it. They had one very uncomfortable lunch years ago and have basically been enemies ever since. And no sooner does she get to Sunshine Falls as she sees Charlie there and, you know, hijinks ensue. So I have read Beach Read by Emily Henry, and then I have read this. And she just does banter and humor and relationships so well, but the connections between the characters, she just has such great character development, but there's so many funny lines. I cried a bunch reading this book. I laughed out loud a bunch reading this book. There's definitely some sexy scenes, open door scenes in this. 
and I feel like she weaves together so many different things in such a beautiful way, but she also just writes very real, very complicated, very human characters who, again, and I mean, I feel like in the same way that I'm connected to this in a Jennifer Hillier book, they are real, they make choices that don't always have the best consequences, they live with the consequences of their choices, they own who they are, they own their mistakes, and they live their lives. And I love that Nora is not apologetic. I love that Charlie is not apologetic. I love sort of how committed Libby is to making this like best trip ever. And she is committed to making sure that Nora has like the perfect Hallmark movie fling. There's so much funny stuff to this, you guys. This book, ugh, this is another one of those books that I just can't wait to reread it because I just want to get back into it. And it's figuring out who you are. It's figuring out what you want from life. It's not apologizing for who you are and for what you want out of life. And I feel like it's such an internal, man, did my text message thing get super loud that time. <laughs> but I feel like it's such an interesting look at, you know, what you're willing to compromise, what you're not willing to compromise. And again, that ownership of who you are, but also sort of discovering yourself. And this takes place, it's supposed to be outside of Asheville, North Carolina. You guys, I have never wanted to move to North Carolina more. And then after reading this book, I feel like I'm so desperate for a new life. And I was just reading this and I felt so connected to Nora in that way where you just get a new perspective and maybe it's just too many years. I mean, I don't live in the city anymore, but listening to her and Libby talk about life in New York City, and I mean, Nora loves it. So it's not like she's trying to get away from it all, but the change of scene, how a change of scene can bring a change of perspective. And I just love books where you get a fresh look at things, you can reevaluate where you are, you know what you do want, you know what you don't want. And I just thought it was absolutely amazing. And it's wholly about this sister relationship, but it's also about finding love and not making compromises in love and about family and about dealing, like I say, their mom had passed away, dealing with grief. We get a lot of sort of flashbacks to things that happened to them when they were younger. Libby is married, she has a couple kids. It's about being a mom, it's about being a wife. There's just so many different layers and levels to this. And then Charlie is probably maybe second to Ben Laterman from Fool Me Once as like, a current book crush right now. I just absolutely loved him. We get a dynamic of him and his relationships and I just, <laughs> he's so dry in his humor and I just love everything about it. So I thought it was brilliant. I really, really did. And I don't know if part of it is being a book lover, not to like play on words, but loving books, having such an active interest in the industry, trying to write books that on that level, I really connected with a lot of that piece of the conversation that was going on in this book as well. But I found romance in this book. I found like a tremendous sister relationship in this book, which I thought was so well done. And I feel like it's not romantic romance, but I feel like between sisters, between friends, that it's all love and romance and relationship and complications. So I think she just did an absolutely outstanding job. So I still have people we meet on vacation to read. And then I know she has written something else and the name of the book is escaping me. I'll put it down below, which somebody had recommended to me as well before she wrote Beach Read. So I definitely need to just like check out her earlier works as well, but such a huge fan. I will definitely auto buy anything this woman writes and I will auto listen to anything Julia Whalen narrates. She's ah, amazing, absolutely amazing. And finally, another book that is also totally dark and messed up. Serial Killer Fans Unite for Unsub by Meg Gardner. I finally read this book. I've talked about it so many times and wow. This is this is like ragdoll level messed up. This is loosely based on the Zodiac Killer. So in this book, we are following a detective, Caitlin Hendricks. She has been a narcotics detective for six months and she winds up getting a call to a very brutal murder crime scene, which is reminiscent of the Zodiac, it's not the Zodiac killer, that's the real life one. Hold please. The prophet who terrorized the Bay Area 20 years ago. And Caitlin's father was the lead detective on that case and the prophet got away and then went dormant for all of these years. But now 
New murders have started, very reminiscent of what happened, and Caitlin winds up getting brought in. So 20 years ago, this case destroyed her father, destroyed her family. So we've got a whole mess of family issues going on here. And then we have Caitlin getting drawn into this case, determined to solve the case that her father wasn't able to solve. And this also brings a whole new level of really messed up ways to murder people. Like this did not shy away from the gruesome. And it has been a long time since I've read a Meg Gardner book and I, I don't know that I necessarily forgot what she could do with a murder scene, but I was like, oh yeah, right, 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 right. She does not, not pull any punches at all. So I really got engrossed into this book and this is the first in a three book series. I do have the other two books. I already had book number two and I just bought book number three. <laughs> I'm optimistic about reading them soon. But we obviously get police detective in this because we are following a detective who is trying to solve the case. And it is just so twisty. I did not even attempt to figure out what was going on in this book. Like I was in it for the ride. Every once in a while, I'm like trying to solve the case. I'm trying to figure out what's the what. In this one, I was like surrender Dorothy. I just went in with it. And man, this book was messed up and i was here for it and it's just like one of those things where you're like no like like i appreciate that she does not shy away from killing people but at the same time it just was so gut-wrenching with some of these scenes and some of these things that were happening but what a well done book i really feel like i missed the boat when this first came out and this was a 2017 release but wow i mean just She's such a gifted writer. This is heavy times, heavy times, heavy. This is not for the faint of heart. And just the, like the, the depths that the prophet goes to, I mean, it's just, it's just crazy. It was really clever. I just, again, very much was a fan of Caitlin. When you read certain books or like watch certain TV shows, like there's certain TV shows where you know, like no one is safe. And sometimes you read a book where you're like, oh, geez, no one is safe in this book. But I was very satisfied with the ending of this. I am super curious to see what's going to happen next. And I'm definitely invested in this series. So if you have had this sitting on your shelf for a while, like I have, allow me to suggest. It's definitely worth picking up. So I will let you guys know when I dive into book number two. I really feel like this needs to be a TV show also. Like, why, why is this not a TV show? I talked about Ragdoll, which the TV show totally deviated from the book, which bummed me out. But I would like to think that maybe they could make a show out of this. It's also inspiring me to finally watch that movie Zodiac, which I feel like there's probably a bunch of people out there who are like, you've never seen Zodiac. I haven't, I have not, have not seen it, but I'm feeling a little bit more inspired to do so. So that's gonna do it for the first part of what I read in August. Let me know if you guys have a favorite book so far or a favorite book that you read this month, if you read any of these books, thoughts, feelings, all the things. And then when I finally, officially get to the end of August, I will film part two because again, I'm trying to sneak in at least one more book, which I'm optimistic I might be able to do. And when that happens, obviously film it, you guys will see it. And in between, you'll probably get to see something else. So. <laughs> Until next time, thank you guys so much for being here, for watching, for all the things, for supporting, for commenting, just everything. Thanks for everything. And I will see you guys in another video really soon. Bye everybody.